I'm starting to see all these different titles and going, oh my gosh, I remember that. Get ready, get, uh, Magic School Bus gets ready, set, dough. Where they get how and how bread works. Are you nostalgic, a parent, or perhaps a child at heart? When it comes to children's media, from books to TV shows, and even movies, there's often more than meets the eye. Is it well written? Does it still hold up today? What works and what doesn't? Or maybe you wonder what went on behind the scenes of that work. Together, a trio of adults who are also kids at heart will critique and comment on one piece of children's media each episode. Hello, this is Eric. Hi, I'm PJ. And I'm Rico. You're listening to Beyond the Lens, a family-friendly podcast. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to Beyond the Lens. Uh, today, th- or this is Eric. Hi, today, this is Eric. Um, I am joined, of course, as always, with Rico and PJ. And today we are going to be discussing one of my favorite television series of all time from a personal and professional perspective, The Magic School Bus. How familiar are you two with The Magic School Bus book series or television series or any iteration of the franchise? Well, I'm very familiar with the original one that aired back in the 90s and in syndication in the early 2000s. Uh, The reboot that was on Netflix, I watched a few episodes in preparation for this podcast. But overall, I guess you could say I'm familiar with the whole concept. Yeah, like Rico, I'm kind of familiar with the original series. I remember watching some of the episodes in elementary school and in middle school. I haven't watched it in a while, but I am sort of familiar with that one. I didn't even know there was a reboot until literally (laughs) hours before this broadcast, so I'm very unfamiliar with that and kind of unfamiliar with the books as well. Awesome. So it sounds like we're all at least a little bit familiar with everything, um, which is great. So... What I enjoy about this entire franchise is the way it's been able to be expanded upon in the various medias. Um, So, of course, we have the book series. Um, Being somebody that did a lot of hanging out at the libraries and a lot of reading as a child, this was a go-to book series for me. Have And you guys, have any of you actually read the books like how do you remember how they're formatted or anything like that Mm, i've come across like a few books here and there i don't remember exactly like i I know it was a book series before it turned into a tv show but other than that i don't really know much about the books yeah unfortunately i wasn't really exposed to the books either I mean, I've heard of them and I've seen what they look like, but I never actually had the opportunity to read them. Okay, cool. Um, So what the the book format pretty much follows what the television series that followed form um, did. So it's a classroom of kids and their crazy eccentric teacher, Miss Valerie Frizzle, um, takes them on all sorts of random field trips on her school bus which happens to have all sorts of magic and scientifical powers um the school bus is also anthropomorphic which is really fun um miss frizzle has a pet lizard named liz the books were first written in 1985 and had been written for about 25 years since then they have gone to do all sorts of different adventures to the moon inside a body under the sea you name it what i loved about these books was the format was so different than regular picture books where it's like miss frizzle took the kids on a field trip and they went here and it was fun and this is what they learned the end what they would do is they would have the narrative plot go through and then the kids would have little speech bubbles almost like a comic book on the different pages and they would like throw out their opinions or like break down bigger words there would also be little boxes with information about whatever the topic was. So like the, they could be talking about um, rain 
and they'll talk about, they'll break down what the process of precipitation is and what the process of evaporation is and and kind of go through and explain all of that. So it's not just like, look, this is a book. This is a fun adventure. Um, so yeah, so I was never somebody that was interested in anything scientific or anything science related. I was like, I don't want this crap in my life. Who okay, cares? Somebody else will learn this. Like, that's fine. So mm-hmm. this, this book series, not only did it get me really interested in reading, but it also gave me an opportunity to learn about the just even basic science and be able to, because it was able to be presented to such a younger audience and they didn't try to talk down to the kids that were reading this book. They very much said, these are the, um, these are the terms. This is what it does in the science form. And let's break it down a little bit so that way you can kind of understand what that means. Um, so the book series was super, super popular in the in the libraries and in the schools, in the classrooms. Um, the original series consists of 12 picture books. Then there were 20 chapter books that were written. Scholastic Reader Level 2 has 33 books, so those are kind of the advanced reading, like continuing to learn different words and break them down and everything like that. Um, then because of the television series, they decided to continue to write more tie-in books with the television series. So there were 32 of those books. Um, there were six different books about Liz, the Lizard's Adventures. Miss Frizzle has three books about her personal adventures. There's a Science Fact Finder book series that's three but different books. Um, there are obviously VHS and DVD release and everything, which is fantastic. Um, another thing that the book series spawned off more or less after the animated series came out, um, was educational software. So I think from a development perspective of what the series was, this was the next logical step is putting you inside the classroom kind of thing and being able to ask interactive questions to verify that you're following what you're learning within the material. So as an example, the first game was the Magic School Bus Explores a Solar System, which is an episode of the TV series as well as a book. But instead of just going in and saying, this is this, and here are some fun things, and we're going to present it to you in an animated form or in a book, they'll give you the information, and then you have to help them get back home or explore the solar system or figure out, like, what the weight is and that kind of stuff. So I remember playing these games. These were almost, if I remember correctly, some of these games were part of our curriculum um, when we got to certain segments of our education in, I think, third and fourth grade, we would get into the solar system. We'd talk about the solar system. We'd read the Magic School Bus book. We'd watch the episode. We would play this game, and then we would take the unit quiz at the end of the unit. So this was a huge part of my early education. So the books were amazing. They were written by Joanna Cole and Bruce Deegan. Um, Did you guys... So for me, Miss Frizzle is probably my favorite teacher in the existence of the world. I love her. I think she's his, hysterical. Her style is amazing. Every single book and episode, she gets a different theme dress and earrings and a headpiece, and it's great. Um, did you guys have a favorite adult book character like Miss Frizzle? Like, did you? Was there a children's book that you read that had an adult character that you strive to be like man it's such a good question but unfortunately i don't have one i mean my favorite book growing up was actually a children's dictionary um (laughs) hyperlexia if that doesn't scream hyperlexia i don't know what does but i yeah i did um i did really like miss frizzle um in the um original series and i definitely agree that she is one of my favorite fictional teachers or i mean teacher overall really because she she did a really good job at at presenting a topic and you know getting the kids engaged i mean it was overall very well written show and that i really enjoyed it yeah i really can't think of many books that i read where there was like an adult character that i 
really identified with or strive to be like. Yeah, Miss Fizzle was a pretty cool teacher. So yeah, Miss Frizzle growing up, she was definitely somebody that I strived to be like as an adult. I said, when I become an adult, I want to be Miss Frizzle. Now, I don't have the hair, I don't have the dresses, I don't have the earrings, I don't have the weird <laughs> headpieces. But personality-wise, I'm doing an okay job <laughs> of just emulating what Miss Frizzle is. Um, so, Scholastic decided to animate the books into a television series. In 1984, the concept was made into an animated series. Scholastic Entertainment was the one that produced it. Um, former Scholastic Vice President and Senior editor, Editorial Director Craig Walker came up with the concept of doing this as a television series animated. Um, this would allow, in the similar form of the books, to learn for kids to learn science in a very fun way. Um, and if you're looking at PBS shows that were running at the time, you had Shining Time Station, you had uh, Carbon San Diego, you had Barney, you had um, Lamb Chop, you had Mr. Rogers. Like, this was the pinnacle of PBS programming at the time. And I think it was, it's been a long time since we've had a lineup like that on PBS where all these shows were just consistently fantastic and also served different purposes. That was another thing that I appreciated about the shows at the time. Um, so the theme song, which I think everyone mm -hmm. has either heard, yeah. knows the words to, or mm -hmm. can dance along to, um, mm -hmm. right on the magic school bus was written by Peter Lurie and was performed of course by little Richard. Mm -hmm. Um, the show's voice director was Susan Blue. Uh, the Some of the show writers uh, worked on Fraggle Rock and then came on to do the show. And I can, knowing that now, I, I can definitely see where the crossovers were for everything. Um, originally in the U.S., Magic School Bus was aired on the Learning Channel and then eventually made its way to PBS in 1998 to do reruns. Um and from there, it's had VHS releases, and the Scholastic still offers like teaching packets and free documents and word searches and worksheets online to be able to connect with the material and everything like that. Um, speaking specifically of the cast, Lily Tomlin is the voice of Miss Frizzle, and I love her, and I think she's wonderful. The series has had a wide variety of different guest stars throughout the years. I know one that stood out to me in particular because, surprise, she has a very recognizable voice, is um, they did a two-part holiday special about recycling, and the person in charge of the recycling plant was Dolly Parton. And immediately I recognized her voice as a kid. Um, there is also the curator and owner of the town Sound Museum, um, and... This character is voiced by Carol Channing, who recently just passed. Um, Rita Marino is in there. Dom DeLuise, Cindy Williams. Oh, gosh, just the list goes on and on. Robbie Benson. Um, oh, okay. So I didn't realize that's who that was. Uh, so <laughs> Phoebe is the girl that always says, at my old school, blah, 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 blah. So there's an episode where they go to her old teacher's garden and they learn about flowers and how, how seeds develop and grow into flowers and everything. So that teacher, her former teacher is voiced by Robbie Benson. So now I'm going to have to go back and watch that episode and be like, I know who that is now. Um, did you guys have a favorite student in the classroom? I'm just trying to remember like all their names. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm blanking right now, but I think if I had to choose a favorite one, cause I mean, I don't really remember that much about their personalities, but for some reason, like the first one that popped into my head, I think his name is Arnold. Yep. Arnold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I th he's the one that's popping into my head. I think he just made me laugh. Yeah. Arnold for me too. Uh, I think he's the one that is always like, I should have stayed home today and... Oh, yeah, that's why. I remember now. <laughs> uh, uh, I, can, 
I can relate to him at times. I don't remember the character's name, but I remember one year finding out that one of the characters, the students, were vo- was voiced by uh, Erica Luttrell, who played Kara on Shining Time Station. I'm looking. Keisha. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. It's so hard for me to choose because I think everyone loves Arnold and especially as an adult connects with him because he's such a worry wart. Um, (laughs) I love, I think Wanda's toughness. um, I very much appreciated. And I was like, yeah, get it. Wanda. The, what I enjoyed too, is that their, their, their strongest traits were their strength and weakness. Um, so Wanda can be very tough and boisterous and ready to go. And sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes that causes her to get into trouble because she doesn't think before she just goes, ah, and just jumps into things. Um, one thing, uh, Ralphie was great. Phoebe was fantastic. I enjoyed Keisha. Um, Dorothy Ann. Ca- I think as an adult, I am realizing that I am way more like Carlos than anything who tries to make fun puns the entire time. And everyone goes, Carlos. Oh, yeah, I remember that, too. That is, that is me. Um, And, yeah, I think Carlos would be the one that I'm honestly most like. Going through this list, and I'm realizing this again, and I know I've mentioned this to friends and people in conversation before this show had such a diverse cast of characters. And this is one of the few shows of that time to actually do that. And I think even to this day is still one of the few shows that you see, you have Carlos is Mexican American, Arnold and his cousin. Um, Oh God, what is his cousin's name? I think it was Janet. Janet. Yep. You were right. Very good. See I was trying to remember, yeah. <laughs> um, they're both Jewish American. Then you have um then you have uh, uh, Keisha who's African American and Tim who's African American. Um Ralphie's Italian American, one is Chinese American. So you have all of these different characters with such diverse backgrounds and different interests. And because they have all these different backgrounds and different interests, they're able to be explored throughout the course of the 52 episodes of the series. Mm-hmm. So sometimes there's going to be a specific focus on the, the science portion of things like we're going to do this. Sometimes they'll be going on a field trip to a concert hall and they'll explain how music works and how Pepper's ghost work. Then there's um, of course, Phoebe, is very interested in gardening. So there's several episodes about spiders spinning webs and um, the uh, planting a seed and and figuring out how the seeds grow and everything. So I very much like that. And I think another favorite character that people often forget is an actual character is the bus itself. Um, The bus is anthropomorphic. He or she... Does it have a gender? Does this are we gendering this bus? It. Okay. <laughs> it says it in all the phrasing. So we're going to say the bus. Um, the bus is able to change its shape into whatever, basically whatever Miss Frizzle needs it to be. So it could be a spaceship. It could be a submarine. It could be a rocket ship. It could be an airplane. It could be water. It could be cloud. Um, which offers so many opportunities to be able to you know, it, it get these kids into those situations. So you have the magic and science balancing each other out, which I, you also don't see very often. You either get magic is magic and science is real and then it's set and that's it. And it's nice to see a ch- children's television show kind of combine both of those things together. And then, of course, you have Liz, who is <laughs> sometimes more responsible than Miss Frizzle. What I enjoy... Okay, so I'm going to go back to Miss Frizzle for a second. So something I very much enjoy about Miss Frizzle is she shares very similar personalities to another literary character and film character, Mary Poppins. They both are very different characters in their personalities, but the way they handle their situations is very, very similar. 
Um, we recently saw the Mary Poppins Returns. And one of the issues that one of my friends had with it was that if Mary Poppins has all these powers, why does she not jump in and, like, resolve the situation? And I, one thing I explained to her was, like, that's not her job. Her job is to do that only if they have to. But she wants to make sure that they understand what they're doing and what the lesson is and all that kind of stuff before she, like, jumps in as a last resort. And I think Miss Frizzle is very similar in that format. Um, she knows that the kids are going to be obsessed with something, which is why they she needs to make sure that they learn a lesson about mm -hmm. something. Um, in the first episode, they go into space and then go explore the different planets. They were going to go to the planetarium, and they decide not to do that and just go to space instead. Mm -hmm. um, so Janet says, I need to correct collect rocks from all the different planets. And uh, so she starts like, piling all these rocks on miss frizzle gets shot off into space and these kids have to figure out how to get home by themselves so when you know miss frizzle's obviously fine the entire time um she wouldn't actually put the kids in danger or so we think as far as i know she wouldn't do that um but yeah she she allows the kids enough freedom to be able to go here's the information and here is your learning now apply that knowledge and see if you can get it out of this situation, which again is why the video games were such an important part of the development of the series is because you then were trying to apply the knowledge that you were taught by Miss Frizzle into getting out of these situations, just like the kids. I would like to briefly <laughs> discuss, by briefly, I mean, we'll probably, we can probably talk about this for like an hour. Um, the parents appear in the show throughout the series. And one of the issues that a lot of people that watch the show have is the parental involvement and knowledge of what these students do on these field trips. Because the parents really seem to have no idea. There are no field trip forms or anything like that. They just kind of do what they want. My only guess is that they had some sort of permission slip that was signed at the beginning saying we're going to go on various field trips throughout the year and this is your one permission slip for all the different places we could end up going and they go okay cool <laughs> and then just not ask about their day i also want to know what the what their parents think of the men mental stability of their children is if they come home and go yeah we were turned into water and we got evaporated and then we got rained down <laughs> no. and then we <laughs> again like that was great um I just, there's a lot of, what are, what are your guys' thoughts on that kind of mis, mm. misled information about the series? Hmm. Honestly, I never really thought about that until you brought it up. I've actually thought about that a couple times. I'm like, there's a couple loopholes here. Like, I mean, what, 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 what do the parents really think? I mean, it kind of reminds me of, um... <sighs> You, you know, me and my memes. Um, there's this one meme where, um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it, it's with Arnold and they're, I think, on the moon. And then he takes off his helmet and, of course, his head freezes. And there's this guy who does this commentary to it. And he's like, yo, he's dead. Oh, he's dead for sure. Like, what about the lawsuit? What are you going to do after the lawsuit? I mean, and then it got me thinking, oh, yeah, what? Do the do the parents really know what they're doing like, or what the kids are doing? That yeah, definitely uh, definitely a thought that's crossed my mind a couple times. I mean, the only time that I've seen the parent involvement is, in, is technically not really a uh, at least not that I know of. It's not an official Magic School Bus related video, but someone like made a parody where. The parents were all anti-vaccine, and so they were the ones on the field trip, and th and they learned all about vaccines, and it just went horribly wrong. Oh, I do remember this parody, yes. Uh. Um, nope, Moving Mind Studio um, made a parody about... Like the kids coming back as adults to save Miss Frizzle. Like Miss Frizzle gets captured or lost in space or something, and so all <laughs> the kids have to come back mm -hmm. in order to save her. Oh my God! It's are she dead? 
Oh my god, I don't even remember. Like it just was so wonderfully shot. <laughs> I'm gonna put it. I'll put it in our in our group chat and everything later, so you guys can watch it. <laughs> nah. Um, it's so good. Um, speaking about the reality of the series, how much do you guys remember about the little snippet at the ending of each episode? Oh, I, I, I remember that very well about how they all call up and complain about the various scientific inaccuracies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so at least with that, I can give them that, like, yes, they can create a fantastic episode and then talk about, like, if Arnold removed his helmet, it would, he would be dead. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> No. But that's okay because Arnold was acting. And like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I very much loved when the kid. I love that the kids would be the ones to call into and be like, "Um, that's not right. That's not how this is done." Because kids still do that, and that's <laughs> why adults do that now. And I'm like, "Get away from me!" Um, yeah. So I I love when they would be able to break it down and kind of explain like this is this is what it was for the series and this is what it was. This is kind of what happens in real life and no kids can't actually shrink down and blah, blah, blah. Maybe one day, maybe one day we'll be able to (laughs) see a magic school went all over the world and it was wonderful and great. And then on June 10th, 2014, Netflix and Scholastic Media said, we are going to do a new series called magic school bus 360. And then that didn't happen. Um, so <laughs> it's it was supposed to be a new iteration of the franchise, which is a modern Miss Frizzle high-tech bus. Um, it stresses the importance of modern inventions like robotics and wearables, camera technology, uh, in order to kind of rekindle the interest out, you know, for that was past the 20-year mark of, you know, gaining more interest in the science and the the STEM research and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I say STEM research as in not stem cell research, but like mm-hmm. s- STEAM. STEAM yeah. is what I'm thinking of. Oh my God, I am so tired. Uh, you know. Um, so yeah, so some of the original voice actors were intended to come back to help with the show, which is great. And then they changed the title to The Magic School Bus Rise again. In February 2017, before the series premiered, Netflix announced that Kate McKinnon would be joining the cast as Fiona Felicity Frizzle, who is the younger sister of Miss Fio- uh, uh, of uh, 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 God. What's Miss Frizzle's first name? Regular Miss Frizzle. I said it earlier. Valerie. I don't know. I'm trying to Valerie. Veronica? Valerie. Or Valerie. I knew it started with a V. I couldn't remember. Like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, so, yes, they... Brought back Magic School Bus and Magic School Bus Rides again. So this is in its, I believe, second season right now. And the third one is in production. Each of the epi- uh, the first and second season are 13 episodes long. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lily Tomlin comes back as Professor Valerie Frizzle, who the reason why she's not in the episodes is... She is going off on her adventures and trying to do some scientific research. So her she gets her younger sister to come in to take over as the teacher. All of the kids are there. Um, I believe it is Phoebe is not there. Mm-hmm. And we are joined by a new character um, who is – give me a moment. Uh, Giotto – Gioti – uh, who is Indian American girl who replaced Phoebe on the magic school bus. She's an expert in science and robotics. So there's your science and robotics person that comes in. Um, and I think she also adds a very interesting character puzzle piece that's kind of missing from the show. So the rest of the class is still the same. So it's almost like they graduated to the next class year. And then Miss Frizzle says, bye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, that, that reminds me as you were talking about things being, uh, real earlier, like, so the, obviously the original series took place in the 90s, I believe, mm-hmm. 
because that's when it aired. And then, if this is supposed to be like the following year, okay, <laughs> okay. First off, how exactly did all the technology that happened throughout the two thousands and early twenty tens just happen during <laughs> apparently summer oh, good vacation? Point. And that's and that's not to mention the uh, the fact that they're still expecting Miss Frizzle. <laughs> Like if this if this is like a regular public elementary school, you would think that they would expect a new teacher, and not not that they're expecting the exact same one. Then obviously they switched it around, but still, it it's just strange. Yeah, and I'm also not sure. It makes me question the school board's decisions on how things work and how, like. Valerie's younger sister was Valerie just I'm my guess again going back to the Mary Poppins thing Miss Frizzle was very persuasive she was able to go into a room and make the room do whatever she wanted Mm -hmm. and make it think it was their idea and I think that is that is my fan fiction-y backstory of how this happened because you can't just go come in and say oh by the way I'm leaving and my sister's coming in like that's not how (laughs) paperwork and background checks and all that kind of stuff work so Mm -hmm. I don't know how that decision was made. So that's my fan fiction decision. She came in with some sort of convoluted plan to uh, almost manipulate them into thinking it was their idea to hire their sister, who is also amazing and has an incredible track record of teaching and all sorts of stuff. Um, Some people were, I feel like the casting decision of Kate McKinnon was very hit or miss. I, personally love Kate McKinnon. I think she's a fantastic actress. And the second they announced her name, I said, done. I am ready for this show. Let's go. She's going to make a great Miss Frizzle. She's going to, and that that was the other thing is that people thought she was replacing the voice of Lily Tomlin and being Miss Frizzle. And they were like, no, no, we're, we're, we've got this figured out. Don't worry. Calm down. So fans, (laughs) <laughs> I, can you believe that fans would freak out over literally anything? I am oh, shocked. Oh, fandoms, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so, from Kate McKinnon's SNL experience, I knew that she was going to be able to bring in character voices in her chaos that she that she has from Saturday Night Live into this role, and it was going to be outstanding. And it was, and she did a she did, and is doing a fantastic job with the series. Do you have any specific opinions about Miss Lily Tomlin or Miss Kate McKinnon? Honestly, I probably would have to see more episodes to really form an opinion. I only saw the first two episodes of season one. I did not really watch much more from the new version of the show it's so it's sort of too early for me to say but I think I I think I like her overall I agree I haven't seen the reboot at all so I really can't form an opinion at the moment but I do like Kate McKinnon as an actress I've seen her on SNL I think she's great um, and I think she, it sounds like she is doing a wonderful job. So I think for now I'm going to trust that judgment, but I, I'm sure she, she's doing a wonderful job. One of the other things that people, people got real irritated because of the animation and I will 100% back their decision and their opinions on that. I'm not a huge fan of flash animation. And coming from a series that was so beautifully 2D animated Mm -hmm. to something so... I think this format of animation works for some things, and I don't think it works for other things. I got used to it with this show. I still don't prefer it. I think it's garbage looking. Mm -hmm. I think it looks like lazy animation. Mm -hmm. It It looks like something that should be... If this was 
web content, like three minute little web episodes, this makes sense for the animation to be like that. And I would be like, oh, okay, cool. That doesn't bother me as much when it's full length episodes. Like, what do you stop? Stop. No, no more. They look yeah. Like- Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just going to say, I saw, like, a screenshot from the reboot, and I'm like, I'm not really sure if I'm going to like this animation style, because it did look very different. I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm going to get used to this. Yeah, uh, I think for me, it's, it might be fine, like, if it wasn't uh, juxtaposed to another show or even another iteration. Like, for example, I know... Uh, Arthur and Cyber Chase, which was originally originally 2D animated, and they since switched to Flash animation, mm-hmm. probably for budget reasons. And honestly, like, like if it was say a whole new show and there was literally nothing to compare it to before, and it might be okay. But if, but if it's like Arthur or Cyber Chase or the Magic School Bus, where We've seen it animated this way before, and now we're switching it to Flash. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like it's too much. I think that's what... That's where they're going to lose... That's where a lot of shows lose their viewers, is when there's such a strong shift. Because it's not even just like, oh, we're transitioning, and it's going to look different. And it's like, it's just such a when you juxtapose them against each other, it's like jarring how awkward it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think because the content is still super strong, the animation, I can kind of overlook the animation. It still bothers me. Mm -hmm. But if that's the only thing that's bothering me about the format of the show, like there's so many other things I could be worrying about with other shows. Um, the other thing that I thought was really fun was the theme song is still the same. It's Mm -hmm. reorchestrated Mm -hmm. and sung by a different person, but the song itself is the same. So the original was sung by Little Richard and they said, well, who's going to give a similar style to this song? And they said, "Mm, who's popular right now? Lin-Manuel Miranda. Let's get him involved. And he was like, yes, let's do this. (laughs) So that's who it is. Yes. And I remember when the trailer dropped and he was like, I've been so excited about this and I haven't been able to tell anybody. And I'm just like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> so he's super happy that he was able to do the theme song for this was I now, now what I'm thinking about is like, when you record something like that, like you record it, you're done. It's once. And that's it. You don't realize like how often this song is going to be played because it's played in front of each of these episodes. Mm-hmm. So like, and that would be the one stupid thing that I, I always find one weird thing that I would like to talk about with a celebrity. And I think this is going to be that one weird thing is I'm going to come up to him and be like, OK, so first of all, Magic School was we got to talk about that. And second of all, his other thing was the um, which went which went viral because it's Lynn and he does what he wants. Um, the him watching Thomas with his kids and talking about the facial hair on the trains. And is like, please, somebody, somebody, please explain this. Well, I did not actually. Oh, did you not know that? Oh my god! So, no. so yes. Yeah, so he he tweeted something about like he was watching Thomas with his kids, and he was like, and Ari and Bert came on, and he was like, wait, I'm so confused. So do engines have to shave? Like, how does this work? <laughs> and, like, so then people started laughing. And was like, ah, oh, you're so funny. So then he posted a picture and was like, no, I'm serious, guys. I'm very perplexed right now. I don't understand this. None of this makes any sense. So that's going to be the second thing we talk about is like th- that nonsense and be like, I'm so happy to be able to listen to your rant. Just scream the into the void and I will be the void that you scream into about <laughs> the nonsense that is facial hair on fictional trains, please. <laughs> um, the other thing that I found interesting, hang on, I'm trying to find this rant so I can have it up. Um, Thomas Tank Engine. Um, the ending bit that we were t- discussing earlier from mm-hmm. the original series, where the kids would call the producers of the series and be like, "Oh, blah 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 blah." Miss Frizzle fills in a lot of that void. So, what I like about this ending bit now 
is Miss Frizzle will be somewhere completely random. And the kids will call her on her cell phone and she'll discuss everything and kind of walk them through it. And then somewhere from between the beginning and end of that segment, you'll get an idea of what the plot of the next episode is going to be. So I appreciate that, you know, they're kind of hinting at at that, but they also kept Lily Tomlin as Miss Frizzle and kept the character of Miss Frizzle within the context of the series. And then it, the, it opens up another weird question of like how manipulative Miss Frizzle is, because if we're seeing where they're going to end up next on at the end of the, at the tag of the previous episode, how much does she, how much does she play into where the kids are actually going next? Or is it just coincidence? Mm -hmm. These are the questions I have for this fictional character. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll never get to speak with, I'll speak to Lily Tomlin and I'll be like, listen, we got to talk about Miss Frizzle. I need you to relay the information to me. Tell me how this works. Explain. <laughs> Explain all of this. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Magic School Bus is doing super, super well still. Mm-hmm. It is. And I think this series really revitalized the books. It allowed for the educational material to still remain relevant. It allowed for the library programming to be able to continue with this kind of stuff. I would like Scholastic to do more live events with Magic School Bus. I know they have done so previously, and I think this is a great opportunity to be able to bring that back. Or they can hire Eric to do that. That would be great. (laughs) I I will dress up as Miss Frizzle if they want me to. I will (laughs) gladly do that for a paycheck. (laughs) I don't think I, I don't think anybody could sound like Lily Tomlin except for so they adapted the movie Nine to Five into a musical, and Lily Tomlin, Dolly Parton, and Jane Fonda were in the original movie, and we were like, how are who who is going to replace them? So they got two big Broadway people to replace to do the roles for Dolly Parton and Jane Fonda. So we were like who's going to do Lily Tomlin? So it's Alice and Janney that does Lily Tomlin. And I was like, this is the best casting I think I've ever seen in anything. And anything that Lily Tomlin does that she doesn't want to do anymore, I think Alice and Janney should just do it. So if for some reason, like, she decides, nah, I don't want to do Miss Frizzle anymore, I think we're just going to give it to Alice and Janney and she can do whatever she wants. (laughs) That's my vote. Alice and Janney is also wonderful. And I very much appreciate her and her acting skills and everything, everything she does. Mm -hmm. That's completely a side rant. That has nothing to do with the actual Magic School Bus. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. here's a fun question. If the school bus could talk and Liz could talk, who would you cast as her voices? Hmm. <laughs> I have no idea. That's a tough decision. Hmm. I'm not sure about Liz, but the Magic School School bus. I'm. I'm not sure if we're gonna be familiar with him. I would say, uh, Jim Conroy. He was the voice of Ref Ruffman on Fetch with Ref Ruffman, and so he sort of has that. Uh, uh, go ahead. I was. I, I. No, I'm thinking of a different person. I was like, did he do Batman at one point? No, I'm thinking of somebody completely different. Yeah, uh, Fetch with and we would not also is another science show, but he always has like he's a voice of rough and he's this always does these weird and comical things and I think I think that sort of personality would fit well if it was applied to the magic school bus. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that. I I don't even know if I would want one in one role or one in the other because I think it would work either way. I think the two ki- voice actors I would cast to play either of the characters would be Tara Strong because she does everything and she can and Neil Patrick Harris. And I think picturing either of those characters talking with either of those voices would be a fun, crazy, stupid adventure. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I think they're good choices. Both of them are extremely talented. 
I also think the school bus itself is extremely talented. <laughs> to be that able too. To, yeah, also to be yeah. able to transform. I want to know how what that workout's like. Like how much <laughs> maintenance does that cost? How does it even work? See, we just bring this into the Weird Thomas co- community corner that's like, how does this work? And this is unrealistic. And I want to be like, let's talk about Magic School Bus. Have fun. I'm just going to no. drop that in and run away <laughs> and watch them just like go on a rampage. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, speaking of Thomas, I, I know there's a Shining Time Station parody on YouTube by I think it's like Top Story Weekly or something like that. And it's and it's basically about Obama's uh r- railroad initiative and they're trying to impose some um, n- new regulations to sort of uh make the railroad more efficient. And and the magic is constantly being brought up and a uh, and one, and the guy with the clip was like, "Okay, by my calculation, this magic dust costs around four thousand dollars a day." <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd imagine something similar would probably be the cost of maintaining the magic school bus as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! I just found so okay. We're side ranting now. I was trying to find this parody, and then I found this other channel that was like a bunch of Shining Time Station stuff. This is the clearest I think I've ever seen the first episode of Shining Time Station. Because yeah. usually you get the gargled like lines on the video, VHS tape, and everything. This is the cleanest I have ever seen. I'm so excited because I'm gonna I'm gonna download this right now. Before it gets <laughs> before it gets taken off, and I'm gonna prove a point and be like, "Look, it's possible. Just do it, Mattel." Anyways, yeah. All right. So, if you are interested in watching the Magic School Bus, you can watch the original series on Netflix as well as the Magic School Bus Rides Again. The second season is the newest season of Magic School Bus Rides Again that is on Netflix. You can also go to your local library and check out all sorts of books about the Magic School Bus, because I'm sure they still exist there, and I'm 100% sure if they don't exist anywhere else, that's where they will be. They will be in the Magic Treasure Chest that is the local library. Um, also, if you want to watch the trailer for the like live-action Magic School Bus parody, it is the Magic School Bus, the movie trailer, fan-made parody is the full title. The... Uh, YouTube channel is Moving Mind Studio. It was published in 2012. It is about two minutes long. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to drop that in our um, in our chat so that way you guys can see that. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts on the Magic School Bus, what it means to you, what it means to education, what it means to the people, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? <laughs> Well, I'm definitely going to give the reboot a try, um, but overall, it definitely played a little bit of a role in my elementary and middle school years. I enjoyed learning about new things through the t- or through the TV series. Yeah, uh, I think the Magic School Bus did uh, did a really good job of like balancing the magic with the science and. It, it, it was a very unique show, uh, and I remember watching uh, episodes in the third grade in science class, and, and yeah, it was, it definitely was a part of my childhood as well. Yeah, I think the Magic School Bus holds a very special place in a lot of our hearts. I It definitely had a huge impact on the television industry as well as education and scholastic. And I think it opened a lot of doors for new media for adaptations from book series. Obviously you have a lot of novels and children's stories being adapted over and over and over and over and over again. But I think this really opened up the door to go, Oh, this, 
we can do this with picture books too. Oh, let's keep going with that theme. And then you have, you know, Arthur and Franklin and Little Bear and all those that <laughs> followed or came out around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I also love the educational component behind the show and it doesn't feel like it's forced because it, it is a teacher and her class going on a field trip. It doesn't feel like we are telling you facts. It's you're obtaining this knowledge very naturally because mm -hmm. the teacher is teaching it to the kids and you are also one of the students that just happens to be sitting at home. And it's a variety of topics that you wouldn't think about wanting to know more information about. And here we are still learning new things because technology continues to change. And with that, the lessons of the magic school bus change as well. So thank you so much for tuning in everyone. This has been Eric PJ and Rico with Beyond the Lens. Make sure you tune in next time for another fantastic, wonderful adventure through the world of children's media. Rico, what are we talking about next? I believe it's PJ's pick, and it's her favorite Disney movie, The Hunchback of yes! Notre Dame. Yes! Oh, you guys aren't ready. I, if I can talk about this <laughs> as long as my voice will handle. I, I love this. Oh, oh. I'm, I'm, I don't even think I'm ready. That's mm -hmm. awkward because this movie is like my least favorite. No, I'm just kidding. I love this movie too. <laughs> I, I, oh, I was worried for a second. <laughs> I've seen nearly every Disney movie. I didn't see this one until later in life, but when I did, I was like, oh my God. I, it's an adventure. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I can't wait for next time. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. And we'll see you next time with uh, Quasimodo mm -hmm. and some some Steven Schwartz and Alan Menken and some all sorts of adaptation <laughs> nonsense to talk about because yes. we've got, we have opinions here. <laughs>